Welcome to the podcast. This is Tanner Talks About Stuff That Happened. I'm Tanner, and I'm going to be talking about stuff that happened. And the stuff that happened that we're going to be talking about today is the journey of the first fleet from Britain to Australia, establishing the very first European colony on the Australian continent. The period we're going to be covering today spans from 1787 to 1791, give or take. So, let us get started. On September 3rd, uh, this is where our story begins, is on September 3rd of 1783. On September 3rd, 1783, the Treaty of Paris was signed, which ended the American Revolutionary War and caused Britain to cede all land east of the Mississippi River and south of the St. Lawrence River and the Great Lakes to the United States and recognize the sovereignty of the United States as an independent nation. The American Revolution, after eight long years of war, had been a success on the American front. Shortly after, Britain would also cede Florida and the small Balearic island of Menorca to Spain, as well as Tobago, an island off the northeastern coast of Venezuela, and Senegal, a coast and West African nation, to France. In professional contemporary terms, Britain took an L in the Revolutionary War and in the Treaty of Paris. As the British army limped home across the Atlantic, King George III searched the world over to find a new land worthy of colonization to nurse his bruised ego. His eyes finally settled on a large, recently discovered land deep in the Pacific Ocean. He set about consulting the few men who had seen the island to decide where to send his colonizing party. One of these men, Sir Joseph Banks, a botanist and patron of the natural sciences, had assisted in mapping the eastern seaboard. He recommended to the king a place they had named Botany Bay as the location for the first colony in the recently christened New South Wales. King George agreed. Though humans first populated the Australian continent around 65,000 years ago, this episode will be covering the European colonization of the eastern seaboard. While an exact date of the discovery of Australia by European explorers isn't available, the first recorded visit to the island by William Dampier, an English navigator, historian, and ex-pirate, took place in 1699. 71 years later, the entire eastern seaboard of Australia was mapped, and in 1787, a colonization fleet known as the First Fleet assembled in Portsmouth Bay, England. The objective of the First Fleet was to bring the first large colonial party to Botany Bay with the intention of establishing a permanent colony. They would be equipped with agricultural tools, the promise of sizable acreage of land free of charge, and two years' worth of provisions. Passengers embarking on the journey with the First Fleet numbered at least 1,350, though exact numbers are hard to come by. Around 580 were free men, women, and children, accompanied by four companies of British Marines and nearly 800 convicts one in five of whom were women. It's an ongoing joke that uh, the U.S. was populated by Puritans and Australia was populated by convicts, and there seems to be a lot of truth to that. In fact, it's almost absolutely 100% true. The reason there were so many convicts sent to populate the Australian colonies was likely due to the vast overpopulation of prisons in Britain. The king's judiciary system in the 18th century was... Extremely harsh, to say the least, and three-quarters of the convicts sent to Australia had been exiled for petty theft and other non-violent property crimes, many on their first offense. The convicts weren't too sad to leave. The alternative was the gallows. So on the 13th of May, 1787, the first fleet, made up of 11 ships and captained by naval officer Arthur Phillip, departed from Portsmouth Bay. There were six civilian transport ships, three supply ships, and two naval escorts. They settled down for the long voyage, one of the longest that Britain had ever attempted. On June 3rd, the fleet docked at Tenerife, 
a Spanish island off the northwest coast of Africa. Here, extra fresh water and vegetables were loaded onto the ships, and the civilians departed the vessels to experience the exotic island. One convict attempted, unsuccessfully, to escape. June 10th, the fleet departed for the long passage through the Atlantic to Rio de Janeiro. This leg of the journey proved to be the first real test of the constitution of the crews and passengers on the voyage. Bedbugs, lice, and cockroaches infested the ship. They'd found their way on board and thrived in the humid, cramped conditions. During tropical storms, the passengers were forced to stay below deck for their own safety, but this led to cabin fever that spread rampantly. Orders to pump out the bilge water daily, the bilge water was the water kept deep below deck and was contaminated with human waste, were taken lightly, leading to disease among the convicts and even death on several occasions. As the fleet passed through the doldrums, they experienced an extreme lack of wind, which stagnated the journey and put the fleet behind schedule. Captain Arthur Phillip was forced to ration water to three pints a day. To put this into perspective, the human body is supposed to consume 64 ounces of water a day, or roughly a half gallon. This brought that down to 48 ounces a day. Not enough quite to cause serious malnutrition or death, but it would add to the cabin fever among the passengers. What the relief must have been like on August 5th, 56 days after departing from Tenerife when the fleet docked in Rio de Janeiro. At the same time, the city was a Portuguese colony, and the people of the colony were friendly to the British, happy to see fellow Europeans on their shores. The first fleet stayed docked for an entire month, preparing for the next stretch of their journey to Cape Town, South Africa. During this time, the ships were cleaned extensively, and all clothing that had become contaminated with lice was burned. Captain Phillips ordered enormous quantities of food from the Portuguese to be brought on board, and likewise, dozens of barrels of fresh water. On September 4th, the fleet departed the docks of Rio and headed across the Atlantic to Cape Town, at the time being a Dutch colony. Britain would take control of the colony in 1814, but there were British citizens already present in 1787. On the 14th of October, the fleet arrived in Cape Town. This would be the last port of call before the long journey to the far side of Australia, and the fleet stocked up on plants, seeds, and livestock intended to populate the new colony. Two bulls, seven cows, one stallion, three mares, 44 sheep, 32 pigs, and poultry of every kind, so says the diary of the captain. The convicts were given fresh bread and beef and informed to enjoy the last sight of civilization they may ever see. Their entire purpose now was to create a colony and the rest of their lives would be devoted to that cause. On the 14th of November, the colonists and convicts watched from the docks of the eleven vessels as Cape Town faded from sight and the first fleet entered the longest stretch of its voyage through the treacherous waters of the Indian Ocean and the Southern Ocean. Very few records exist on this section of the voyage. The most prominent thread running through each account is that the weather was unpredictable and varied greatly from day to day. One day, there could be little to no wind and it would put the voyage behind schedule. The next, great gusts of wind could propel the ships in excess of 100 miles, putting it ahead of schedule. In one account, a freak storm came on so quickly that it blew one crew member overboard before he had a chance to tether himself to the ship in some way. Before the end of the journey, all wine stores ran dry, and the water was rationed strictly. As supplies began to become a great source of anxiety on all ships, the leading vessel, called the Friendship, sighted Van Diemen's Land, now called Tasmania, an island south of Australia, on January 4th, 1788. The passengers celebrated, but not for long, as another violent storm struck as they attempted to sail around the north end of the island. The storm was so chaotic that it damaged the masts and sails of several of the vessels, restricting the progress of the voyage. Undaunted, the first ships in the fleet arrived at Botany Bay on the 18th of January, 1788. It was intended that they would arrive several days in advance to pave the way for other settlers, but the storm encountered north of Tasmania had allowed for much of the fleet to catch up, and they arrived only hours later. <laughs> 
several other ships arrived the following day, and the slowest arrived on the 20th of January, concluding the great journey. The first fleet had traveled for 252 days across 15,000 miles without losing a single ship. According to one source, there had been 104 recorded deaths on board and 20 births. They had completed their journey and began their disembarking in Botany Bay. The initial landing was plagued with misfortune. In the days following the initial anchoring in the bay, it was discovered that there was very little fresh water, the soil was not suitable for farming of any sort, and high winds were constantly battering the ships holding steady in the bay. In addition, the trees in the area had grown remarkably strong to counter the wind, and men were breaking their agricultural tools in an attempt to remove them. When gunpowder was brought into the mix as a solution to remove the trees, Captain Phillips decided that there had to be an alternative site for a settlement nearby. As the rest of the settlers remained in Botany Bay, Captain Phillips took a small scouting party 12 kilometers up the river to a location that had been named Port Jackson 18 years earlier by James Cook, who had discovered the bay. Staying in the area for three days... Jackson found that the area was nearly ideal for a new colony. The water wasn't as shallow as it was in the bay. It was sheltered from excessive winds. There was ample fertile soil and plenty of fresh water. In Philip's own words, quote, The finest harbor in the world in which a thousand sail of the line may ride in the most perfect security. He named, he named the new site Sydney Cove after Thomas Townsend, First Viscount Sidney, the British Home Secretary. You may be familiar with the name of the colony in New South Wales, as it would come to be known as Sydney, Australia. Today, the largest city on the continent, home to over 5 million people. This was not the end of the troubles for the colony. The voyage had been very hard on the health of many of the settlers, and most were too weak or sick to be productive farmers, never mind the lack of skills held by the criminals. After early efforts of agriculture were widely unproductive, the leaders feared for the future of the colony. In the coming months and years, the colony would become isolated as most of the ships, save two, returned to Britain for more colonists and convicts. As supplies dwindled, another colony was established on Norfolk Island, 1,400 kilometers off the east coast of Australia, and many convicts from Port Sydney were transported there in an attempt to find another source of food. It was found that the soil on Norfolk Island was much more fertile and there were plenty of trees with viable timber for building houses. Food began to be transported from Norfolk to Sydney Cove to the great relief of the colonists. Just as there was a glimmer of hope for the colony on February 3rd, 1790, one of the ships was wrecked during a supply run, leaving only a single ship to sustain the colony. Their two ships had been traveling from Cape Town to China to Norfolk Island and back again in an attempt to gather as much food as they could for the starving colonists, and now, with only one ship to bring back enough food to sustain more than a thousand people, the situation looked grim until, on June 3rd, 1790, the Lady Juliana, a transport ship, was sighted. It carried 225 female convicts and was the first ship of the second fleet that had been sent to assist in growing the struggling and starving colony. Two weeks later, a second ship was sighted, loaded with provisions. The colonists threw themselves on the rations. Days later, the rest of the second fleet arrived. The Second Fleet has become historically notorious for their treatment of convicts on the journey from Britain to Port Jackson. A quarter of the thousand convicts on board had died before their arrival in New South Wales, and another 40% would die of illness in the first six months of their landing. The colonists had hoped that most of the Second Fleet would be ships carrying provisions, but the number of convicts it had brought, with many of them sick, put an additional strain on their supplies in the following year as a severe drought further dampened their spirits. Things seemed hopeless until, in 1791, the, thir the Third Fleet arrived with over 2,000 convicts and enough provisions to last the colony several years. The severe drought also concluded in 1791, and the first successful harvest was recorded. 
the arrival of the Third Fleet brought hope to the colonists, and it now seemed that the colony would survive after all. New buildings were planned, and new land was allocated for prisoners to start to farm. Now, that's essentially the end of the story that I'm going to be telling today, but there are a few points that didn't seem to fit anywhere in the story so far, so these are the few points I want to make. The colonists first made contact with the Aboriginal people, the people native to Australia, in 1788, shortly after their arrival. The native people were curious, but very wary. Captain Phillips signed into law that on this land, forever, there would be absolutely no slavery of any kind. Though the native people were deeply and negatively affected by the arrival of the Europeans, they were never enslaved. As the Europeans began to hunt and fish locally and diseases brought to the land began to harm the tribes neighboring the settlement of Sydney Cove, most notably the outbreak of smallpox in 1789 which decimated the tribes, the Aboriginal people took action and led several assaults on the colony. The first was in 1788, where five convicts were murdered. Larger scale conflict did not break out until the 1800s and Captain Phillips strived to remain peaceful with the natives, even when under an apparent immediate threat. But interactions with the native people were not all negative. On several accounts, aboriginals volunteered to guide the British colonists to hunting grounds and sources of water. When an explorer became lost and was wounded in a wild animal attack, he was recovered by natives who nursed him back to health and brought him back to the colony. Aboriginal people also accompanied other expeditions to find new land suitable for settling and taught the colonists about which wild animals were safe to hunt and which were too dangerous and should be left alone. Another note, an interesting fact that I dug up was that while the official economic unit to use in New South Wales was the British Pound, a secondary form of commerce was rum. Good old run-of-the-mill rum. Now, the last little factoid that I do want to talk about is that while slavery was outlawed in the new British colony, indentured servitude was very commonplace. With the arrival of the First Fleet, convicts were placed into free homesteads and forced to work for the free family in exchange for food and lodging. This remained very commonplace until the early 1800s. Now, there is so much more that I could say about the colonization of Australia, but the primary purpose of this episode was to detail the journey of the First Fleet and the arrival in New South Wales, and to provide a general understanding of the events that took place without going into too much detail that the general gist can be lost. So, with that being said, Thank you again for listening to Tanner Talks About Stuff That Happened, a crash course on general history. If you enjoy the show, please leave a rating wherever you're listening and tell your friends. If you are interested in some kind of subject that you'd like me to talk about, go ahead and email me at tannertalksaboutstuff at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening, and I will see you in the next episode. Bye-bye.